If you're an athlete, you know the greatest motivator of all is the fear of letting your teammates down. After all, a team is only as good as its weakest link. So you owe it to those wearing the same jersey as you to be your best every time you step on the field. That's why there's no vape in team. When you vape, you can expose your lungs to toxic chemicals that can damage your lungs. If you're a step behind, the team's a step behind. Brought to you by The Real Cost and the FDA. We know the brain changes with sleep deprivation. We know there are brain changes with exposures to screen and then with some of the content. Lassie could figure out that this is a bad combination here, but yet we seem to just keep pedaling right down the road. We as the parents should begin to sort of put up some guardrails and realize that this is a by design, well orchestrated attack on our young people. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Fill in the Blanks. Thanks for coming back. I've got a very important guest with a very important message today, Dr. Nicholas Cardereth. He is a PhD, LCSWR, and he is really an expert on addiction involving technology. He is the CEO and founder of Omega Recovery in Austin and Mary Recovery in Hawaii. I want to just brag on him for a minute, but I want to get right to talking with the doctor. I believe he is the country's foremost digital addiction expert. And I did say that digital addiction expert, because I think these smartphones and these games are like digital crack for some of these kids, not just kids, but particularly kids. He is the expert on this digital addiction and its impact on mental health. He speaks all around the country and the world on this. He's a former clinical professor at Stony Brook Medicine in New York, and he specialized in teaching about the neurophysiology and treatment of addiction. He's taught neuropsychology at the doctoral level, and these things do actually change the brain when you spend enough time on them. He's author of Glow Kids, came out in 2016. It's the seminal book on the clinical, neurological, and sociological aspects of technology addiction. And when I say that, I'm talking about all of the devices. It could be smartphones, video games, and where you go when you're on them, social media, the different platforms. Glow Kids has been translated into a dozen languages. He also wrote Digital Madness, which examined what an unhealthy infatuation with technology leads to and how social media is driving our mental health crisis. You've probably seen him on television. He's been on 2020, GMA, CBS Evening News, Fox and Friends, NPR. He's written for a number of publications. So needless to say, he's got more degrees in the thermometer and a ton of experience in this. I'll just get to him. Doctor, thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. That's uh, you raised the bar kind of high for me now, so I'm not going to try not to disappoint. Got lots of pressure with that kind of introduction, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Can't choke me. Thank you. <laughs> well, you should be really proud. I call it digital crack. You say it's like digital heroin. <laughs> What's going on with this, and when did it really kick in, in your opinion, and start changing the way kids are evolving and developing? Well, I think we've been. You know, we've been in the digital age now for the last 10 to 15 to 20 years. And I think I think one of the problems that happened, Dr. Phil, was that you and I, our generation, sort of, we were asleep at the switch when this new generation of technology came along. We just started with smaller TV sets. And so we conflated modern screen time with TV, and most of us grew up on TV. So we let the fox into the chicken coop without really fully appreciating some of these impacts that were different with interactive and that's the key part this interactive and immersive media is not our daddy's television from yesteryear where we would sit 10 feet across the room in the living room and we would be um visual we weren't participants in the experience we were observing a tv show we were watching a tv show now we're immersed in it so that has a different not only psychodynamic effect but neurophysiological effect so the the short sentence that i like to say is that this new technology is 
brain altering and mind shaping. And, and that's, I would say in the last 10 years, we started seeing the telltale signs of habituation and what looks like addiction. And then what that leads to, what, what is some of, what are some of the byproducts of our love affair with technology in terms of everything from depression and personality disorders and all the rest of it. That is a good short sentence. Say that again, because I want people to hear it and remember that particular sentence. Yeah. So brain altering and mind shaping. So brain altering in the sense that these devices do change the neurophysiology of our brains. And the MRI research has been pretty clear on this in very similar ways to substance addiction. So our brain goes through neurophysiological changes as a result of excessive screen time and mind shaping, meaning that they influence us. So especially our younger folks who are uh, getting involved in certain digital media, social media platforms, uh, everything from social contagion type of things where we're seeing young people. It's not just Kylie Jenner influencing people's values or what matters. It's you have some extremely popular psychiatric influencers who are creating a mimicking effect with everything from borderline personality disorder to dissociative disorder to gender dysphoria. You have a whole host of people mimicking these influencers in the way that you and I, when you and I grew up admiring, you know, I like Michael Jordan growing up, Joe Namath, they were influencers, but they weren't in our pocket 24 seven. And so the influencers of yesteryear are not quite the influencers of today and their impact and how they shape people. Yeah, that's for sure. I really want all of our people that are listening or watching right now to stop and think about what you're saying here. All of you that are with us right now, whether you've got kids or grandkids, you really need to stop and think about how complicit you may be in contributing to this because the average age that kids are getting smartphones right now is around 12 years old, a little younger, according to the research. And they're spending hours a day on these things. We'll talk about what they're doing on them in a minute. But I've got grandkids that one is almost 13, the other is almost 11. And the 13-year-old has a very controlled cell phone. and Her parents are paying attention to parental controls and screen time and all that, but still, her friends have them, and who knows, you know, how much they're getting on them and what they're doing. It's hard to control, but I want everybody listening to stop and think about this because this is not just something to chat about with your friends while you're walking on the track or at a cocktail party. This is a big deal. This is changing this generation, and it's changing America's future, and we need to do something about this. China has actually taken some very bold steps in what they're doing in terms of just passing a law. I don't know how they're enforcing it, but they've actually passed a law, as I understand. Is that correct? Yeah, and China and and so China and Korea had been way ahead of the curve in addressing that this was an issue. China had said this was their number one health crisis 10, 12 years ago. And, and there are over 400 treatment centers in South Korea just addressing technology addiction. So they understand the problem. Now, I don't agree with how they're treating it. They, right. they have these sort of militaristic boot camps, and there have been some um, not wonderful things done there. But they're very plugged into the no pun intended, they're very plugged into the idea that we're too plugged in. Right. Um, I I think just to echo the one point that you made, Dr. Phil, we're changing seismically the way our society operates, and we're changing fundamentally the the brain at a pretty fundamental level. And and I think if you look at the psychiatric metrics, right, um, the the younger you are, the more likely are you to to be more psychiatrically unwell. So if you, if we looked at the generational cohort starting with baby boomers and go on down to Gen Xers and millennials and Gen Z, each decreasingly younger cohort has higher and higher rates of psychiatric distress, higher anxiety levels, depression, suicide, overdose. So before the pandemic in 2019, our young people had the worst psychiatric metrics in recorded history. They had the highest overdose rates, depression rates, ADHD rates, every way that you can slice and dice and measure psychiatric distress 
was an all-time high in 2019, pre-pandemic. And then COVID happened. And what we did was we dropped a nuclear bomb on already toxic dynamics. We were more screen dependent, more isolated, more quarantined. So all those numbers spiked throughout that. So we're going through a mental health crisis. And if you have to look at it from 30,000 feet, we have to ask ourselves as a society, well, what's changed in the last 10 to 15 years that might be making our young people more suicidal, more self-loathing, more empty, um, more acting out violently, school shootings, and, and all of those are related issues. And the common denominator is our immersion into this new digital landscape that's changing us. Yeah. And I've had this conversation with people that I know, not necessarily on the air, but people that I know, and they say, look, I understand the pandemic spiked everything, but how can somebody having a smartphone create such a mental health crisis? It just doesn't seem that those two things would be so connected. And by the way, the pandemic, I personally think it was hugely mismanaged. I think the quarantine was hugely mismanaged. And it did create an exacerbation. Mm -hmm. But this turn in a negative direction for the mental health of our young people predated that, we really started seeing these increases many years before. We started seeing real upticks in, what, 08, 09, 10? That's when we really started seeing spikes in this. The iPad and the iPhone, right? Yeah. And if you go back, I've said it was like, I don't remember exactly when it was, but around 08 or 09, when the smartphone became really prolific, it was like, big cargo planes flew over the United States and just dropped these things on society. Everybody had one. And so, you know, everybody was walking through life with their head up. Now you look, everybody's got their head down looking at their phone. It's a quantum shift. It's a huge, huge shift. So people say, okay, well, how is that changing development? I remember when I was 15, 364 days, 23 hours and 59 minutes, I was down at the DMV to get a driver's license because the second I turned 16, I wanted a driver's license so I could become really mobile. Now, it's like they hardly care. They're watching people live their lives instead of living their own lives. They start dating later. They start driving later. They're less accomplished in interpersonal interactions. Right. They're not involved in the world because they're watching it go by on a little screen. And to right. me, that makes us so much less competitive with prior generations and certainly in the world competitive market. I just don't see how this is not going to have terrible consequences, not only for the individual, but for our society. It's slowing everything down. You know, I think it's dampened. It's created a, a stunting dampening effect on adolescence. What you said was exactly right about the driving. So um, lower, lower permit and licensing ages, lower participation in team sports, uh, later dating, less sexual. Uh, our, our teenagers aren't having sex the way that they used to um, because the gravitational pull of the digital, the digital crack is makes everything else boring or too much effort requiring. So a lot of the young people that I work in my clinics they are uninteresting and uninterested. They're flat. There's an emptiness there. Everything, they've been so overstimulated by visual, digital stimuli, whether it's hardcore pornography or whether it's immersive gaming or whether it's the, the information overload of social media, that the real world is just, oh, it's too boring for them. So our challenge is to try to get a young person who's been so desensitized by this new media that's inundating their every every part of their lives to get back into the game, to get back into, uh, per, uh, you know, where I live in my local community, they couldn't feel the varsity football team at the high school for the first time ever really? because there weren't enough teenagers that were willing to put in the footwork and the time that it takes because they were gaming. Um, and they're not dating either because that takes social skills and, and everything else. So I think we're underappreciating quite how it's impacting all of our young people in this really profound way. And, and then the main thing that I think also keep in mind is we're evolutionarily hardwired to be social animals. We need face-to-face -face 
human interaction. And that was, you know, for obvious reasons, the tribe survived. Our strengths came in our community support of one another, both in the prehistoric times to medieval to the present. And now in the social media age, it was, it was the, the false, you know, the irony of it all is the Kool-Aid that we were all given about something like social media was social media for a social species was supposed to be this elixir. It was going to be like chocolate and peanut butter coming together. It was going to be a match made in heaven. And what we're seeing is that social media is an actually anti-social media. It makes people more alone and isolated, and it drives what's called the comparison effect, where you have all these people now comparing themselves to everybody's outsides, everybody's digitally curated selves, and that makes them feel worse about themselves. You just said a word in there that was just one word, but it is so big, and that's curated self. I said they're watching people live their lives instead of living their own life. And that life they're watching being lived is a fantasy. Right. I had some guests on recently that were influencers. Some of them were very honest to say that the life that they're putting out there is a complete fiction. Right. They said, you know, I'll get all dressed up and talk about, hey, I'm getting ready to go to some big event or red carpet event or NBA playoff game or whatever. So I'll stream this and pick out outfits and people commenting on what I should wear, et cetera, et cetera. And then as soon as I close the door, I put all that stuff back in the closet and go sit out on the couch yeah. and watch reruns of Friends or something. Right. Or get back on the social media and watch what other people do. And people say, gosh, my life's so boring compared to that. And then they feel worse about themselves. Right, right. And the more the more friends you have or the more connected you are on social media, the more of those reflections you have looking back at you, amplifying your own sense of negative self-worth. And so it's interesting. There was a great uh, Netflix documentary called uh, Fake Famous, and they showed these three kids that were different parts of the country, different socioeconomic backgrounds, and they were going to use all their resources, this documentary was, to boost them into the stratosphere of influencer level. And these, you couldn't have met three emptier, shallower, more upset, more self-loathing young people. And, and so it's creating a values shift, right? Because now the coin of the realm in social media is viewers and it's how many likes and clicks. So, so what gets the most likes and clicks? It's not the accomplished, thoughtful, discerning person. It's the performative court jester, right? Whether it's, whether it's the person in the fake jet or again, going to the psychiatric part, We've got this TikTok Tourette's phenomenon where you've got these psychiatric influencers who are so performative in the psychiatric disorders that they're getting hundreds of millions of views. And now their followers are saying, well, they're popular because they have this uh, dissociative identity disorder or they have Tourette's. I think I'm going to start tw not consciously or unconsciously. They're beginning to twitch or have alter identities or go through some of these issues. So it's really shaping the society in such a toxic way. And we, we didn't pump the brakes enough in terms of fully understanding, because I don't think parents knowingly wanted to do anything that harmed their kids, but I think they drank the Kool-Aid that there was an educational aspect to the, you know, they didn't want to fall behind. If my kid doesn't get an iPad when he's seven and Johnny next door has it at age five, maybe my child's not going to be ahead in this new technological era. Where meanwhile, uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, the founders of Google, Jeff Bezos were all Montessori students. These guys didn't have a an electronic nothing until they were 14 or 15. So the smartest minds had natural childhoods where their brains were allowed to develop organically, as opposed to these stunting devices that are causing some people, some psychologists are calling it childhood dementia, that some of these neurological effects are beginning to look like dementia, cognitive delays, memory delays. That's so bad. And I think a lot of parents do mean well. All the cool kids have the phone. So they think, mm -hmm. well, everybody's got one, mom. So I, you know, I want to have one, dad. So they wrapping them up and giving it to them at Christmas, they might as well give them a bomb and <laughs> wrap it up. You mentioned the MRIs, and this is impacting the brain the same way substance addiction does, both in hijacking the pleasure centers, but it actually changes the prefrontal cortex as well. We're actually seeing some shrinkage in the brain for people that spend 
excessive time on these devices. Right. Talk about that a little bit. Right. So, so as you know, the prefrontal cortex is where the executive functioning of the individual lives. That's where the person's decision-making, their impulse control, their ability to consequentially think, what we call if-then thinking, all lives in the prefrontal cortex. And the two main parts of the prefrontal cortex that are getting impacted by screen time have to do with gray matter and white matter. So the gray matter, how robust the gray matter is in the prefrontal cortex, we're seeing what's called DGM, dense gray matter shrinkage, uh, in the same way that you see with substance addiction, where that part of your brain that really needs to be healthy and robust for you to make good decisions in your life and to not be impulsive, because impulsive is one of the main things that we're dropping on this generation. We're making them all hyper impulsive because of this uh, brain impact. So the frontal cortex is shrinking from the gray matter. And then the white matter, which is the myelination of the brain, which is the myelin sheath, as you know, is the insulation cable of the axons and the neurons of the, of the brain. And how robust that myelin sheath is relates to how well and how optimal the brain functions. And so things that can compromise the myelin sheath of the white matter um, slow down the brain's functioning. And these are like things like Alzheimer's and dementia are, are white matter abnormalities. So what they're showing in MRIs is microstructural abnormalities in the brain's white matter in the prefrontal cortex. So actually damaging that part of the brain that we need the most at key developmental ages. Now we, you know, you and I might be able to absorb a little bit of uh, of uh, micro <laughs> structural abnormalities because we've we've passed those developmental windows. But when a child who's supposed to be developing their attentional abilities, their language skills, their cognition, where they're going through those key stages and we're dropping this ne neurological bomb into their lap. And then we're wondering why Johnny isn't curious or interested or why their ADHD rates have doubled, why addictive disorders have spiked. Because once you get someone primed for impulsivity, they're more vulnerable to all sorts of addictions, substance and otherwise right. at that point. So we're going to have a stunning of growth for the brain. And these are in some formative times because, as we know, the brain keeps developing at least until 25. Right. And probably longer, certainly in males. I want parents to understand about dopamine and why these kids are so fixated on getting likes and feedback and why they're so fascinated by reading comments that people they don't know will never meet are sitting in their grandmother's basement in Boise, Idaho typing away and may well be keyboard bullies that just get off on sending hate messages. But talk about, if you will, the dopamine impact and how it parallels what happens when people take cocaine or crystal meth, right. for example. Right. So these platforms are not addictive by accident. These are very bright people who have made these various platforms, whether it's social media or gaming platforms, habit forming by design because they're dopaminergic. They spike our dopamine in ways that are very, uh, they activate the dopamine reward response. But what's interesting is in, in the way that they've manipulated this. So every time we get, you know, something feels good, we get a little dopamine spike and something um, uh, gets released in our brain. You know, we get that when we, you know, evolutionarily dopamine, the dopaminergic response was supposed to be to incentivize two basic life-sustaining functions, eating and procreating. And when we eat and when we procreate, we get a dopamine spike. These devices hijack that dopamine response. And there was the one most fascinating study was back in 1998, Dr. Cope did a study where he looked at, it was published in Nature Magazine, and they looked at what activities or substances raise dopamine, how much. And so eating raised dopamine 50%. A sexual activity raised dopamine 100 percent and cocaine raised it 300 percent well back in 1998 video games he threw video games in there they were raising dopamine 100 percent uh, which is the same as a sexual activity so the way that a parent should look at it my my eight-year-old is on a digital platform that is giving him the same dopaminergic arousal that a sexual activity is now the difference is Little Johnny doesn't have the breaking mechanisms of the prefrontal cortex fully developed because they're right. not 25 yet. And 
it's for an extended period of time. Not, not to get crude on your podcast, but usually a sexual experience tends to be short lived. Right. I've had, I've, <laughs> unless you're Sting or somebody with some, um, but I've had gamers who have gamed for two or three straight days without sleeping, without eating. So you're spiking that dopamine hour after hour, day after day. So you're going through this dopamine cascade and then you go through this dopamine crash, which very much also mirrors substance addiction. So when we try to, when we tell our kids, I only want you on your gaming for half an hour, you can't tell somebody who's smoking crack, only smoke crack for half an hour. Um, you just don't have the ability to moderate that. So it's, it's a, we're setting up our kids for failure when we're trying to moderate something that's so hyper arousing for them. So, 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 so the narrative is age appropriate technology. There are certain ages that are more able to handle this. Right. Let's talk about what happens because you have great protocols for helping those that have really gone over the high side with this. What do you see in the first few days when you're detoxing someone from this digital heroin, digital crack? What do you see with these kids when you're going through detox in a treatment center? Yeah, so we do a digital detox for the first six weeks, and you see exactly the same response you would when somebody's detoxing, primarily off of a stimulant. It looks, because this is a stimulant, this is adrenal arousing, adrenalergic, and dopaminergic. So in the same way that in the usually in the first 48 to 72 hours, really aggressive types of behavior, really sort of impulsivity, you see a lot of reactivity. Um, you know, in the same way that if any of your viewers try to stop drinking coffee and they haven't, you get irritable, you get moody, um, but that tends to taper off after the second or third day and people tend to kind of go back to their baseline, but parents don't want to push through that. When parents are trying to sort of go through this detox process at home, next, you know, anytime John or Susie gets irritable, they, they sort of give in to the hostage demands and they, they give the devices back. They're not willing to push through the uncomfortable period. And I get it. I understand. It's not easy to do that. We have a hard enough time doing it in a structured, facilitated residential treatment environment. Right. It's difficult when you're so involved and you hate to see your child hurting and uncomfortable and hear the things that they say. They actually become aggressive oftentimes during these first few days, right? I've had multiple, multiple parents who have been assaulted. The police were involved. You know, uh, when I've gone to some of the homes of my clients, the telltale signs, the holes in the sheetrock, you know, the the explosive anger that happens. So, and that's why it is a little bit, be careful. Maybe it's, it's not always, depending on how severe your son is or your daughter is, how explosive they've been. Sometimes it's not the most safe thing in the world to do this without professional assistance. Um, yeah, people can get aggressive. Yeah, I tell them it may be just over their pay grade and you and I are dealing with some examples and stories very soon where the child can panic. There have been suicide situations. There have been situations where kids get homicidal because they're so immature. Yeah. If a gun is handy or they do something again, it's like the perfect storm, right? You yeah. have problems with the impulse control centers, which aren't developed and then are further eroded you've got the withdrawal effects and it's just a perfect storm where this can it's go exactly really bad. Right. It's like taking away a drug from a drug addict while they're actively, they're not thinking straight and they're irrational. You're exactly right. So that in my book, I was able to document there were at least 12, a dozen cases here in the U S of matricide or patricide where a young male gamer killed their parent in the, in this uh, perfect storm that you described situation and and more often than not, because I looked at each of the case studies pretty deeply, these weren't, um, how can I put this? These weren't kids that were born bad. These weren't kids that were hardwired. But in most of these cases, these kids were actually good kids who sort of fell down the rabbit hole and and lost themselves. You know, it's interesting. Sometimes it builds up across a matter of weeks or months, and some are really highly susceptible, clearly they were predisposed and they can go down that rabbit hole in a matter of a few days. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen, I've seen that. I know, you know, we'll be talking to, uh, I think a guest of yours, that's uh, that was that kind of an example. And we know that there are some kids that are more predisposed to be vulnerable. It is a little bit of Russian roulette. I've seen 
the three letter athlete uh, honor student fall down the rabbit hole. And then we've also seen the, you know, the kids who had the more historically challenging mental health issues. Cause if you're, you know, some of these issues are what we would call bi-directional forces. If you're depressed and you feel self-loathing, you know, and you're, you're a gamer, you know, these gaming platforms, you're, you're achieving a sense of success. You're actually leveling up. It might be the only part of your life that if you're a young man, you're feeling a sense of accomplishment in. I analogize it with like a violin virtuoso. You've got somebody that's admittedly devoting 10, 12 hours a day to their passion, you know, in this case, gaming or the violin. And, and then you're asking them all of a sudden to stop it because you don't have any balance in your life. You know, all the telltale signs of addiction, um, it's adversely affecting your daily functioning. You have no social relationships. Your academics are failing. You have no social relationships. Well, at a certain point, does it come time to put down the violin? Even if you're the best violin player in the world, you don't have a life anymore. And so I've seen, you know, we see a higher propensity of with male gamers with uh, on the spectrum. If you have uh, any kind of Asperger's or spectrum disorder, you're more likely to perseverate on screen experiences. But it also happens to the most healthy. And it's hard to predict who might be vulnerable to these effects. Well, I've had relationships with families in the past that have had Olympians and pro athletes where the child was so focused on that one sport, whether it was a gymnast or a tennis player or whatever, that everything else in their life was pushed to the side. And they really did suffer burnout at a real early age. They got to the point where they said, look, I I don't want to spend nine hours a day sacrificing and eating a certain way and training and you know, living like a monk. I'd like to go to the mall. I'd like to eat popcorn. I'd like to hang out. But the rest of their life just suffered because they were so devoted to that one thing. And I can see it happening with these kids. At some point, they're going to wake up and say, hey, I've missed out on life. Now, let me ask you something about gaming, because I've seen the research that much to the surprise of parents said that the violent video games did not predict that those playing them would then go do that in real life. The research that I had seen is 10 or 12 years old. Since then, these games have become more realistic, more interactive. The characters in the games can be now role-play characters with the person playing them, and they're so much more realistic does that still hold true? Does playing those violent games not predict that they will go out and do that in life? Yeah, well, no. Well, so increased aggression is the byproduct. Now, whether increased aggression leads to a school shooting, that's the $64,000 question. Craig Anderson at the University of Iowa, he's been sort of the, the grand wizard of aggression and, and the violent media research for 25 years. They've conclusively said violent media leads to increased aggression. Now, again, as I said, does increased aggression mean I'm going to shoot up to school? Or does it mean I'm going to kick my sister or maybe take a punch at someone more? But it definitely leads to increased aggression. And the more realism that involved, the more you raise the amplitude of that aggression, the more you desensitize folks to violence. You know, we used to say back in the day, uh, if you watched Bugs Bunny or Wile E. Coyote, that was violent cartoon content, but it was not real. They did specific studies where they looked at, they they used as variables things like there was one video game where they did it without uh, sound effects, and then they did it with blood and without blood. And the more realistic it became when they added the a modification of blood, when they added a modification of sound, like in Grand Theft Auto 4, they added when you would hit the prostitute with a baseball bat, which is, you know, this is a game our eight-year-olds are playing, you would hear the thump, thump, thump. So the more realistic, the more the amplitude of the aggression raised. So, you know, some of these games right now, you're, you know, they're especially with the virtual reality added dimension. Um, so a lot of our kids are reality blurred. I've worked with, you know, my first, my first entree into this whole arena was a 16-year-old who was referred to me who was having an episode of digital or video game psychosis. And he was playing World of Warcraft 12 hours a day. And he was Dr. Phil. He was in the Matrix. He didn't know where the game ended and where reality began. He was in the full dissociative state. 
and had no psychiatric background. There was no family history of psychosis. This was a kid who hadn't slept for days, had been in this immersive world, and now had a psychotic break and had to wind up getting psychiatrically hospitalized. He got put on antipsychotics, which was a mistake. He shouldn't have been given antipsychotics because all he needed was to get some sleep and to unplug for two or three days. But then he went down the psychiatric, uh, you know, he went, they treated him like a genuine psychotic patient, which he wasn't. Uh, but we've seen that, you know, we've seen how hyperrealism and immersion can really impact people in ways that they can then lead to violent episodes. And we've had, you know, school shootings, you know, I like to say there's a statistic where not all gamers, of course, are going to be violent or school shooters, but every school shooter has been a gamer. Um, and, and, and there's not just the desensitization that happens when you're playing these violent games, but there's also the social contagion effect of when I'm a lost, empty outlier, whether I'm, I'm an incel, like sometimes now they're speculating that the Idaho murderer is an incel, um, and you find community in some of these online chat rooms, and these communities now sort of begin to inflame your uh, aggression or anger, and you're finding role models, because let's face it, uh, when Columbine happened in 1999, Columbine was the first internet school shooting. And before Columbine, there had only been the Texas Tower shooting in 1966 with a brain-damaged Marine. You had Columbine in the era of the internet, and then copycat after copycat after copycat. And the FBI had even said, these kids are emulating, because let's face it, social learning theory. We know that we we live our lives by emulating role models. And once you put that out into the ether, um, uh, Adam Lanza, the, the Connecticut school shooter in Newtown, Connecticut, they, the FBI had found at home, he had a, a butcher block sheet of paper with every serial killer on it with a, a point total next to their names. And he was trying to be quote unquote high score. And the one FBI investigator said he was convinced he was in a fully psychotic episode play, playing out a fantasy video game. Adam Lanza had been playing a game called school shooter where the player in the video game goes classroom to classroom shooting students. Um, so you tell me whether that impacted that young man's uh, horrible mass murder. I've said for decades, if I wanted to make someone psychotic and I could only control one variable, it would be sleep disturbance. If I keep somebody awake long enough, I think I can make anybody break these kids that are staying up for days and days playing these things endlessly, and right. then they have all this stimulus coming in, that's part of that perfect storm that can happen on the gaming side. The sleep disturbance gets underappreciated by parents. Oh, Johnny's up in his room. He's up till 4 o'clock in the morning. Dr. Hebb was a, psychologist, was a researcher back in the 50s who did uh, research on isolation, sleep deprivation, and some sensory deprivation. And you got these college students, of course, you know, they get these grad students to, you know, participate for, you know, for $10 in the study. But he wanted to see, and this was research that he was really doing for enhanced interrogation. And um, and what would happen if after two weeks of taking some of these young people and having them be sleep deprived, they wore blindfolds and mittens on their hands. They didn't have any sense of time or awareness of what was happening that way. What would happen after two weeks of them not sleeping? And none of them made it past 72 hours. And if you read the transcripts of that study, they were all hallucinating by 48 to 72 hours. One of the, the graduate students wrote about seeing six foot bunny rabbits jumping around. All of them went psychotic just from the sleep deprivation part of it. So you're right. Sleep deprivation and, and hyper immersive uh, synthetic realities, digital realities are a recipe for disaster. When you break it down like this, like we're talking about, we know the brain changes with sleep deprivation. We know there are brain changes with these exposures to screen and then with some of the content. Lassie could figure out that this is a bad combination here, but yet we seem to just keep pedaling right down the road into this, which is why I wanted to do this and have this conversation so parents understood not only does the research say that these dangers are obtaining, 
but it's not just correlational. If you look at the factors here, the changes in the brain, the social impact with the depression and suicide in response to the hate messages and the, why don't you just kill yourself? You're ugly. You're this, you're that. I suppose we still have to say it's correlational because we can't draw a bright red line from those messages to some 12-year-old girl uh, attempting to take her life or actually taking her life, but it's awfully hard to ignore the juxtaposition of those experiences, and parents just have to pay attention to that. They just can't pretend that's not there. And I think the other thing that I think is important to keep in mind, I said earlier that this has not been by accident. You have big tech and some very sophisticated people that work designing these platforms. And I think it was a, a blessing when we had uh, Frances Hogan, the Facebook whistleblower. She came out last year and she showed us the internal emails of Meta and Instagram. And their own internal research showed that these platforms were harmful to young people. Suicidality in teenage girls went up 12% in England, 6% in the U.S. Um, um, eating disorders were exacerbated by 17%. Their own internal research said, our stuff is toxic. And the, and the internal email dialogues were, should we change the algorithms to make them less harmful? And it was, no, nope, because the less toxic the algorithm, the less engagement. And so it was a similar, it's a similar thing to the Purdue Pharmaceuticals and OxyContin, where they knew that their product was habit forming and harmful, and yet they they sold it anyway. To Big Tobacco, where Big Tobacco knew it was a carcinogen, but they marketed Joe Camel to kids anyway. So that's where I think a curse on their houses, because it's one thing if a company doesn't realize, oops, you know, maybe our product, we we didn't realize there were some harms happening, but by their own admission, these were designed to be habit forming by their own research, they're harmful. So now you have, like it was just in the news three days ago, the Seattle school district is suing Meta and Snapchat uh, for harming the mental health consciously of young people. So we as the parents to begin to sort of put up some guardrails and realize that this is a a, a by design, well orchestrated attack on our young people and our young people. You you were saying before when you've worked with some uh, Olympic athletes who got burnout after a certain point. Well, our young people are experiencing burnout, but they're in they're in a, a digital cage that we big tech has trapped them in. But it's a sugar coated cage that they like the taste of. And so they're not saying I want to check out yet because even though they're self-destructing and their lives are collapsing and becoming smaller and smaller, they like the taste of the cage that they're in because it's tickling that dopamine there. So they're not they're not opting out yet. I really wonder if B.F. Skinner and some of his colleagues could have ever foreseen how their research on locking people in and resistance to extinction, all of that was going to play out in gambling and gaming and addiction to all of this. I bet you they're turning over in their graves watching how yeah. all this is being used to program these toxic right. elements into these devices. Right. Baked right in. It's baked right in. And the, the problem is that we as the adults, we're too busy playing Candy Crush to, we're also trapped in the cage too. So we're not noticing that. I mean, I've got 15 year old twin sons, identical twin. I've got a natural twin study at home, by the way. I've got identical boys. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> and, you know, and it's interesting. One is more, uh, you know, I delayed, you know, the message I try to give parents is delay, delay, delay. You know, de as much as you can delay giving your children these devices, the better shot they have at having a more developed brain and social development to be able to handle them. And the more able they are to develop countervailing um, activities in their lives, like you're more likely to, you know, if you, if you have some interest, if you're playing sports or a musical instrument and you've got a social network, you're more, you're less likely to fall prey to some of these things. So, you know, the older a kid gets, the more likely they are to have what I call a healthy psychological immune system. But if you have a compromised psychological immune system and then this digital virus comes your way, you're going to get snake bit. You're so right. And I hope parents hear that. Old sayings become old sayings because they're profound. Like, you're not mm -hmm. going to get a hit if you aren't swinging. 
if your child is involved in sports or choir or arts and crafts, whatever it is, and they're getting rewarded from that, they're going to be less subject to becoming dependent on something like this. I watch my grandkids, for example, and they're all involved in year-round sports, and they're into scuba diving and all these Mm -hmm. different things. And it's like, I know that they see all of these things, and I see them with these groups of friends and stuff. And I think that's really, you said, it's an immune system against this because they have so many things that they get paid off from. Right, right. I kind of analogize it the other day to people talk about, you know, the old cat woman down on the corner that just lives with 50 cats but doesn't deal with any people. It's just easier. The cats don't require her to take a shower, get dressed, get in her car, go out, meet people for dinner, have a conversation, answer questions, go back and forth. It's just easier to stay home with the cats. It's the same thing with these digital relationships. You don't have to be an interesting conversationalist. You don't have to be a good friend that's there during hard times. You aren't required to put as much effort and energy into it. You just click or don't, and you make a comment. It doesn't matter if you're in your pajamas and slippers. It's so much easier, and they don't develop those skills. But for 99.999999% of the people, it doesn't pay very well, so eventually you're going to have to get out there and compete. But unfortunately, because I think you nailed it, Perfect. That's exactly what happens. All those other activities take, they take initiative and effort. And so, but now we've primed this generation to lean into not putting in the effort, you know, stick to itivism, resilience, grit, all those things that we know are important. Um, so many of our young people lack those ingredients now. And it's not as if it's a switch that you can magically turn on. You know, the kid who's been couch, you know, living on his mom's couch for 15 years isn't going to magically develop grit. No, Um, I mean, we try in our treatment program to kind of change the course of history. But once you ingrain some of those bad habits, it's really hard to undo. And that's, I think, the message for parenting. It's easier to prevent than to treat. And so if we could prevent some of these issues from happening and be thoughtful, look, it takes a lot more effort to be a tech cautious parent. I know that there are plenty of long drives. It would have been easier to drop the tablet in the backseat of the car when my kids were being noisy or whatever, it takes a lot more effort. But at the end of the day, the reward is greater and it's worth the climb because it's easy. And then let's face it, every parent who uses the digital babysitter, they have that little justification. Well, it's educational, baby Einstein. And I was told by big tech, it's good for them. Yeah, they wouldn't lie to you, of course. Oh, and by the way, here's the new model every six months for you to buy. Right. Why would Apple lie to us? Right. But I try to tell parents that The way children form their self-image, their level of self-esteem, their level of self-worth is by observing themselves overcome the challenges and obstacles of life. If they see themselves make the choir or make the team or get out there and form friends and go to a slumber party and get by and go to college and get along with a professor they don't like, et cetera, et cetera. They observe themselves do that, and they attribute to themselves the ability to overcome challenges and adversity. And if you don't require that of them, you cheat them out of the ability to observe that in themselves and attribute the traits, characteristics, and qualities to themselves that, hey, I can do this. I can do that. Right. Like you say, it's hard to unring those bells when you've passed those developmental opportunities without seizing on them. And I really worry that we're raising a generation here that's not learning about themselves the way they need to and the way they could. Well, And and at the other end of the parenting continuum, you have the negligent parent, but then you have the, you know— the helicopter parent who is also robbing their child of the opportunity to figure things out for themselves because they're bubble wrapping their kid and they're not allowing them to scrape their elbows and to learn from for what they're doing. So 
all those things that you're talking about are exactly spot on. And that's why in, in our treatment program, what you talked about overcoming obstacles, we do a hero's journey process where, you know, we're trying to tell our young people who are stuck in digital escapism that you can be the hero because most video games are the hero's journey in a digital format. So right. it's, it's a protagonist. It's an avatar that's overcoming all these fictitious uh, obstacles. And so we tell our young people, you be the hero in your life. What is what are the obstacles that you need to overcome that you need to lean into so you can actually feel the, a genuine sense of accomplishment, not level 43 in fictitious digital game X, you know? So you're exactly right is how can we help our young people lean into experiences, lean into establishing resilience and grit and failure and picking themselves up and all those things that some parents are uncomfortable with. So, you know, we have to learn a bit too as the parents and how to better do this as well. Well, and a lot of these parents are sitting right next to the kid or in the next room and they're on TikTok or Instagram and doing the very same thing that the kid's doing. So they feel a little hypocritical if they take too hard of a stand. Right. And that's a problem. But let me ask in closing, doctor, what is your advice to a parent or grandparent that's listening right now that has input, their kid has the smartphone, they are on it more than they need to. We didn't go through all the hours, but they're spending more and more time on these things. They are using them. They've heard what we say and they go, wow, we're who they're talking about. What are first steps that you recommend for them to do? And as you say, if it's extreme, they probably need professional help. They probably need your treatment centers. They probably need to be in there. But for those that want to take first steps, what do you recommend? Yeah, I think young kids and teenagers, they don't like being told what to do, right? So if you're sort of that nagging parent or grandparent, you get shut shut out pretty. You become that Charlie Brown teacher wah, 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 in the background. Yeah. But they respond to, I found that kids respond because they don't like to be manipulated, showing them something like The Social Dilemma, that documentary, which pulled back the curtain from big tech, the the engineers of big tech saying, hey, this is how we're manipulating you. And I have had young people respond really positively to what I'm being manipulated by these people. It's like, yeah, so you're not being a rebel. You're not a rebel. You're a rebel without a cause right now because you're just being monetized and manipulated and and 14 and 16 year olds respond to that if you show them a, right. a well a well produced documentary like that can be eye opening for some of them uh, because if you're just going to sort of drone on and on that get off your device you're going to get shut shut out eventually so showing them some of this the research showing them some of the the ways that they're being manipulated can be really helpful in addition to giving them other things to engage in backdooring some recreational activities going out for a trip or if it's camping or having them join boy scouts or girl, you know, any kind of experience that can backdoor in um, less time on screens uh, without even doing it overtly. They don't even have to know that that's what you're doing um, can be helpful. Yeah. Get them where there's no connectivity. <laughs> right. Right. Go to camp, yeah. go to some other types of experiences where you don't, you know, they don't want to go to a digital detox boot camp, but they might want to go to a surf camp or they might want to go to, you know, a, a horse ranch, for six weeks over the summer, these are things. And oh, by the way, there's no phones allowed, but that's not what you're going there for. You're going there to get a nature experience. Well, that's great advice. I want to tell people again, Dr. Nicholas Cardera's book is Glow Kids, which came out in 2016. It's still available. And it really gives a lot of insight into the clinical, neurological, and sociological aspects of technology addiction all kinds of devices. He also wrote Digital Madness, which examined what an unhealthy infatuation with technology leads to. Takes a real hard look at social media. Of course, you'll see him on my show every time I can get him cornered, and that's also going to be coming up very, very soon. Doctor, we could go on for another two hours on all of this, I'm sure. I hope we can have an opportunity to do this again. As I say, we could go into another hour and not repeat ourselves one time on things that need to be talked about. So I hope you'll honor me with some more time in the future where we can talk about this some more. 
And of course, and, and thank you for the work you're doing to raise awareness and all the wonderful work you've done for the last multiple decades. Thank you. Well, I appreciate it. I look forward to seeing you very soon, actually. Likewise. Likewise. Right. Thank you, Dr. Thanks Phil. so much. All right. By the way, if you're having any ideas about suicide or self-harm, pick up the phone and call 988. Help is available in Spanish and English. Call 988 if you're having any thoughts about suicide or self-harm.